Neck throughs, guitars, they're like a guy that you won't have a beer with you. I want to hear what's pushing the notes. Freddie King and B.B. King, Albert King, and let's not forget Burger King. I don't want to blow my knuckle out. Stainless steel is the work of the devil. These go to 11. From the East Amplification Tone Labs in Baltimore, Maryland, it's the Amps and Axes Show. With your hosts, Jeff the Godfather of Low Wattage Amps Bober and Mick Marcelino. Well, good day to you, Mr. Bober. Right back at you, Mr. Marcelino. And guess what? I'm, I'm, what? We got a new piece of equipment. Ooh, new technology. Yes, thanks to our good buddy, Mr. Jude Gold. Yeah, he turned you on to this, didn't yeah, he? Man, yeah, man, this is this is awesome technology. This is the Zoom H6. It's it's a it's a work of art. It, it really is. is. So, it's a phenomenal little thing. First off, it's a little bit bigger in your hand. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're running forty eight volts on four double A's, and yeah. uh, and we uh, it's, it's, it's phantom power cool. records you know until the year twenty twenty five. Yeah, and, something, know, like, something that. like that. But this is so. Neat, and uh, what it's done is, is it now even made us more portable than what we were before. Absolutely. Yeah, the M Audio was a perfect piece of gear, um, but we just have we we're gonna need this. Oh, absolutely. And we yeah, got a thing coming up, and we got right. some things coming we got up. Got definitely and, yeah. some things coming up. You know, we're gonna be more places. Yeah, doing and, more things. And if we uh, if we have to get on any kind of uh, planes or trains or anything, these things go through a little bit easier than. Uh, <laughs> yeah you got three laptops you got this box you got this other thing yeah so yeah the m box oh, by the time people are hearing this the m box has probably been sold on eBay. sold on ebay but yeah. it's uh it's up on ebay it's the uh yes it's it's the thing that served us well for all this time i really it, it was it's a fantastic product so it, it is but this is i mean this is so this much just takes us to the next level of portability and that was the thing that we've been looking for since day one right but these guys just hadn't had it out then. yeah this this they hit it out of the park with this one i think yeah 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 so we uh make sure though uh, also our listeners uh when you finish listening to this podcast jump over to jude's no guitar safe no guitar and, is um, safe follow you know, follow him in this helicopter <laughs> right <laughs> it's great oh stuff. and speaking of listeners thank you yeah thanks for listening yeah the numbers are going crazy i love that yep and uh you know of course go to amps and access cast.com with the dub 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 and when you get in there make sure you click on all the social links and you know right. do all the stuff you know subscribe do all that the yeah, itunes everything we're social Facebook. you'd be social too you can like us. That's right. Like give us, us. The give likes. us the big thumb up. <laughs> thumb up. I never understood some of that stuff, you know, because it's like Cecil the Lion was murdered. People like it. And they, yeah, <laughs> they right. give it's it a like, like, and it's like, do you really like that the idea, you know? Yeah, there should be. You know, <laughs> so, sometimes a post needs a button yeah. that like, this is horrific. I, I agree. Or, oh, I agree. Or, oh my God, I hate this too. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. What, some, so, so, you know. <laughs> Now we're weeks on, out. Facebook. We're weeks yeah, out we when you hear this, but yeah. you know that that whole thing was just bizarre. That's true. Yeah. And speaking speaking of weeks out, we're um, we're still going to be weeks out by the time this is airing. But we're gonna we're gonna start uh, letting you know. Yes. Um, that plans are in the works for uh, for us to take the show on the road for an entire weekend to Nashville to the Nashville Music Gear Expo. And that's uh, gonna be sweet. November thirteenth to fifteen. Uh, hotel. Hotel Preston, I believe it is in Nashville. It's, it's uh, Hotel Preston. Preston. Yeah. Hello. But uh, yes, um, <laughs> we're taking uh, East Amps out there, and we're taking uh, Amps and Axes on the road with it. That's going to be our first. Yeah. And well, first, 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 first weekend. Of, first of many. That's right. Where we leave the state. That's right. To go talk to people. That's right. We jump in the helicopter and go. <laughs> <laughs> we we'll have to call Jude up. Hey, man, bring the helicopter. That's over. right. Bring the helicopter back. <laughs> 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 that's awesome that's that's a pretty funny intro to his show so listen to that but yes. continue to listen to ours first absolutely you know, at least finish up with us first yeah because you know we let artists just go crazy we do we do we do <laughs> their there's stories some, yeah, which are awesome 
we uh, we try never to uh, to lasso anybody, and it's just free reign. No, you know, and we've been having so many guitar players. Yes, so many musicians. And you I said to me, I you said, know, Mick, we got to change this. Up. You gotta, said, you know, it is called amps and axes. It is supposed to be about gear, <laughs> it's so not musicians. And once, once, in a, you know, and and it's it's great, you know, to talk about the people that that are powering the amps and the axes, you yeah. know. Mm-hmm. But sometimes you got to talk about the amps or the axes, or or stuff in between the yes. amps and axes, and that's where we're going today. Yeah. Now, Johnny, just to give you a little little bit of a heads up. Mm-hmm. He was the one who contacted me about Chris Poland. Ah. Because he does work on some of his old gear. Right. And then he said, no, no, he's alive. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just saw him. I worked for him. And then yeah. I had to proceed to apologize three times. So right. there we go. <laughs> well, now you get to do it in person. Well, not, not for Chris Poland, but you get to do it to Johnny because... He'll be on the air. Johnny Ballmer uh, is our guest today from uh, Alchemy Audio, so... Uh, we'll have to thank him, yeah, for um, you know for letting you know that that Chris is is alive, and <laughs> well, and <laughs> you know, okay. then we'll have Chris on. Uh, you know. Yeah, I wish he would contact me. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna take a quick break here and um, get him on the line, and then we'll be back with our guest of the week, Mister Johnny Balmer from Alchemy Audio. Hi, this is Dave Martone from Vancouver, Canada, and you're listening to Amps and Axes. And also, we can't forget. Yes. Our good friend. Mr. Mr. Jason, Jason Sedidis. Sedidis. I won't <laughs> screw his name up ever again. Ah. And what does he do? He does he his. He does a quick lick. He does the quick lick. That's right. So, so you guys have got to come that. to the page. Yes. Come to www. Because I like saying three W's. Triple dub. Amsonaxiscast.com. And scroll down about, I don't know, halfway. Yeah, about halfway. Could be. You're yeah, going to see his video. There's, there's something and then there's something and then, and then there's Jason. <laughs> You know, that's usually the way it goes every week. There's something, and then there's something, and, or then there's something. You know, first there's something, then there's Jason. Then there's and something. we just love He's that guy. There. I know, totally. Yeah, totally. Did yeah. a little Kemper thing for us. He, that was badass. He did. Uh, yes, he did. Yeah, he did. Yes, that was badass. Did. And yeah. I got it right, and I feel so proud because my ears are so screwed up. But it was very cool. It was very cool. It yeah. was very cool. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm patting. I'm, I'm virtually patting you on the back. Thank you. Yeah, that's you only. That's, that's my. That's my claim to fame, ladies and go. gentlemen. <laughs> so, uh, back to the show? Sure. All right, and we are back, and as promised, our guest of the week, Mr. Alchemy Audio himself, Johnny Balmer. Johnny, how are you? Gentle- gentlemen, great to talk to you. How are things in uh, Baltimore? Uh, we're, we're good. We're good. Yeah. And, uh Wow, he called right. us gentlemen. That was it. Took me took me for a second. There. Yeah, it's just like, wow. Exactly. <laughs> like, I think we have the wrong show. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> giving you the benefit of the doubt here. Oh, absolutely, giving you the benefit of the doubt. Well, thanks for taking the time to be on with us, man. Thanks for taking the time. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, uh, you know what? I um, we're, we, we, I definitely want to talk to you about the uh, you know the pedals and the stuff that you do there and. And also the other stuff that you do there. Uh, it's, uh, it's more than just a one-stop shop, uh, and we'll get into that. But um, wh- wh- where's your shop located, number one? Uh, in Chicago. In Chicago. Um, not too far from Wrigley Field on the north side. So on a beautiful summer day like today, you could definitely walk over there. Awesome. Now, are you a hometown Chicago boy? I'm not. I've lived here since 2002, but I primarily grew up in the Minneapolis area. Oh, okay. You know, Joel was telling us, Joel Danzig, that uh, Chicago, small town. Mm-hmm. You know, you may miss yeah. it if you, if you drive too fast. <laughs> yeah. A few million, uh, people. Few million people, that's it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. One of the world's tallest buildings. You know, right. yeah. it's, just, it's just Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you may have heard of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like people have kind of heard of Baltimore too, you know. So yeah, but uh, all right. So, um, so what did you say, Minneapolis area? Yes. Um, musical family. Uh, what, what was it? What you know? What where where did uh, where did Johnny come from? Give us a little history. Is, it, is, is this the way back machine it, portion of it? It is the way back <laughs> machine. I just I, I hate using that every every week, but you know, yes, it is. Tell I, us a little about I've yourself. I've been listening. Man. I see. See, I've nice. been listening. Nice. So that's good. That's good. <laughs> so yeah, um, Minneapolis. I primarily grew up there. I first became interested in uh, music and specifically guitar um, as a teenager, like most people did. 
and uh, I had a friend, childhood friend, that uh, was taking lessons from uh, the local, you know, mall music shop. Mm -hmm. This was probably when I was in about seventh grade, and so uh, you know, it was something that I decided I wanted to do as well. And and uh, the nice thing about this uh, music shop was, in addition to these lessons that you could sign up for, they would also rent you the you know the guitar and the amp and while you were taking lessons you had uh you know this access to this equipment that you could bring home and practice on and so it was a a nice way to you know gain entry into guitar lessons without a, a huge investment on my parents part so that that was kind of how it started nice and it's you know it's really nice that places used to do that maybe some still do i don't know but it's it's really nice because i think it enabled a few more people to, to you know to to get into music yeah. you know if, if you if you couldn't afford to buy even the least expensive guitar for your kids you know at least you could probably cough up a couple of bucks a, a week to to rent one you know i, I got a i got a story oh do you <laughs> so <laughs> let's hear it so at a period of time in my life i had hair down to my ass okay right i look like cousin it and uh, you and me both, brother. And there was a store that said they rent equipment. So I went in mm -hmm. and I said to the guy, I said, uh, y you rent these guitars? And he goes, yeah, rent option to buy. And he went, what kind of music do you play? And I said, well, I play heavy metal. He goes, not renting to you. <laughs> <laughs> and I just went, um, well, okay and he goes nope every time i rent to one of you metal guys the thing comes back it looks like it's been through a war he goes i can't even get rid of it and i was like huh. i think i've worked on some pedals like that <laughs> right and i was like Man. stomped on by jack boots and you know yeah. think, about, right. think about today though if somebody said that to you today it'd be a lawsuit the press would be there the guy be closing right. his shop the oh, next yeah. day he'd be putting him out of business i was you know, just and... like well you're not gonna get my 30 bucks a month thank you you know <laughs> <laughs> well, see, that's back when you could say something like that because it was the truth and you would suffer a great loss had you continued to do that. So, oh, you, you know, smart. I'm, yeah. cu I'm cutting my losses and no more metalheads, you know? Exactly. You know? Yeah, I, I'm not going to make any more comments about metalheads. <laughs> so, so, okay, uh, we get into the, the guitar rental Thing and uh, yeah, so you know, started off with lessons. I believe they rented you a Hondo Les Paul copy, nice. with a, probably a PV practice amp or something similar. And uh, you know, I, so I did that for the summer, and then at some point decided that it was something that I was actually going to stick with and, and pursue. And um, the first guitar that I remember buying with with my own money was a Squire Katana. You guys remember those? No, not a katana. It was, it was Fender's uh, attempt at competing with you know when the pointy guitars were all the rage and mm -hmm. Jackson had their Randy Rhodes uh, you know V shaped. Yeah, this was kind of similar, but it was more like triangle shaped. It had one pickup and I believe one volume, one tone control, if wow. I remember correctly. And this was like 1985. <laughs> wow. wow. I, I, you know, it obviously was not a success, and it probably was only produced for a year or two. And since but, you can't uh, remember... I, I was one of the people that was uh, <laughs> uh, thought, saw the appeal in that guitar, at least at the time, and uh, that's that's what I ended up with. Now, now since you can't remember, the, you know, the, the configuration of, of pickups and, you know, maybe one tone and one volume, I'm assuming you don't have the guitar. And it it is safe to say I no longer have that you know, And it was probably only made for a year, and, yeah. and, and someday somebody's going to go, damn, these are now going to be called collectible. <laughs> and because oh, they're I, I, I see them these days on, you know, the online sites, and they're selling for much more than i probably paid for them and, you wow know, there's there's someone out there that yeah well wants you know still fly that flag you so. know you know what's funny is is that you know fender and gibson were i don't know how much fender was but i know gibson man they were hurting during those years because kramer jackson mm -hmm. charvel, charvel they were kicking the piss out of them and yeah. and you know nobody wanted the les paul nobody wanted an sg the explorer survived and mm -hmm. the flying yeah. V's did because they were, you know, they were different. Point, pointy. You know? Yeah, they were pointy. pointy. <laughs> um, but, you know, if it didn't have a hockey stick for a headstock, man, you yeah. couldn't move it. Yeah, and, and I think Kramer's probably were the first ones to bring in uh, 
the the import line, right? And yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Kramer, the, pa- Kramer, the Pacer series, Pacer, and and uh, BC Rich also had I, an import line. I think I owned yes. my fair share of Kramers back in the day too. Yeah, wow. yeah, they were something else because they teamed up with Floyd Rose and it was Eddie Van Halen mm-hmm. and that's yeah. all it took. Yeah, between Jackson with Randy Rhodes, you think about that guy. That guy was such a huge influence. That guitar is still one of their number one sellers. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. crazy, and, and, man. And he was he wasn't around that long. So. No. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Well, so, well and, and speaking of which, you know, that was definitely, you know, when I was getting into guitar playing and music and, and heavy metal specifically, that was definitely one of one of my main influences and someone that I, you know, appreciated and tried to emulate as best I could. Cool. So uh, okay, we, now we have one for uh, Randy Rhodes, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yes. As far as influences go. Uh, John Sullivan, yes. too, from Sully Guitars. Remember, he was a big Randy Rhodes guy. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. right. That's right. So I was going to ask you what kind of stuff you started to get into, you know, with your uh, with your Honda Les Paul and your PV. But yeah, well, you know, like most teenagers that came of age in the, you know, this would have been like the early to mid '80s uh, when heavy metal and hair metal was kind of exploding. Um, you know, that was that was kind of what I cut my teeth on was the, you know, the Motley Crue, uh, you know. Ozzy era, Randy Rhodes, you know, Randy Rhodes era, Ozzy. Um, those were probably my, you know, my big ones. And then, you know, later on that evolved into like, you know, Guns N' Roses and, you know, kind of second wave of that. Um, well, you, 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 you know, you either had, uh, you had metal or you had new wave, you know? Right, right. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and new and wave, I guess you know, metal just spoke to me more. At the I, time. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> you know, new wave was a lot of that stuff. Um, you know, JC 120 clean for as far as guitars go, yeah. you know? Yeah. And uh, I, I, I had a, when I played that, I had to run a compressor on the JC 120 because it was so clean and so immediate with nothing. You had, you had the attack and then nothing. <laughs> you know, it was like, you know, Were you, you had, a new wave guy back in the day. I played my share of it. Yeah. yeah. I played my share Excellent. of it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that, that's what I, I used that for clean. And, uh, and later on, of, uh, uh, 1969 100 watt Marshall for dirty. There you go. Nice. You know. Yeah, I think it, at some point in probably the mid 80s, uh, a boat pulled up to the New York Harbor that had like uh, you know six of those shipping containers filled with those uh, those Rollins. Oh yeah. And we've yes. been using them ever since. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, um, uh, did you and your Hondo and your PV? Uh, Make it onto uh, you know a, a stage or a, or a block party or a, a CYO yeah, or anything. Yeah, you know? so, you where know, did that go? I, where did that go? Kind of, I kind of woodshedded and cut my teeth in the, in the bedroom like most people do for you know for a few years, and then uh, you know hooked up with friends in high school that were musicians or beginning musicians, and just started playing in a succession of bands and. Uh, that continued uh, in my teenage years into you know early 20s and uh, probably the biggest uh, band I was in if at least you know if you were from the Minneapolis area was a, a band uh, called Sister Morphine so oh. I guess uh, what we perhaps lacked in talent we made up for in uh, having the good judgment to name ourselves after a Rolling Stone song <laughs> <laughs> Sister Morphine sounds like a sludge rock band or something, doesn't <laughs> yes, it? Yes, yes. <laughs> well, there's some names out there that we won't say that... That's true. <laughs> well, that's, that's true. A lot of Zs and a lot of words that didn't have them back then. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. So, you you know, the... Uh, did you do a lot of Stones? I mean, now that you named your band after a Stone think, song, I think we did a few covers from time to time. Um, you know, mostly what we did were originals. So at least oh. I guess you know at the time when a lot of people were just covering songs, at least we you know we were writing our own material and playing and um, did that for you know well into my you know early twenties and you know you see those. Uh, vh1 behind the music episodes and i kind of lived and did the same thing on a smaller scale in minneapolis and lived to tell about it so nice i mean <laughs> like like pro- professional kind of you know we we toured and things like that or a little bit we played bit. around the you know the five-stater area we would open for 
any of the bigger bands at the time that would come through. So, you know, our, our big claim to fame was that we once opened for Wasp. If you remember them. Oh, awesome. My God. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Chris Holmes was the guitar player, right? He was. Yeah, and he was in the movie uh, The Decline of the Western Civil Civilization, The Metal yes. Years. The Metal Years. Hammered, Very famous scene in that movie, too. Hammered out of his goddamn mind <laughs> in a pool with bottles of Jack floating around him. Takes the have biggest... You, have you seen him lately? Oh, he's rough looking. He, he, he lives in France. <laughs> he just released a music video, which if you... I think I've seen that thing. It's available. Yeah. It is unintentionally one of the funniest things you will watch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Now I got to see this. Yeah. And there's a, in that scene, though, the pool scene, his mom is sitting on the side of the pool. He's in the pool mm -hmm. on, a, on a, like a lounge chair that floats, right? He takes the biggest swig of Jack Daniels you've ever seen a human take. I mean, it just kind of melts into the pool. Yeah. And it just goes into the pool. <laughs> Um, for the longest time, and it's like, is he drowning? I mean, the camera crew, nobody's moving. His mom's sitting there with this disgusted look on her face, and uh, the camera guys are silent. Everybody's silent, and it's like, uh, is the uh, the drunk guy uh -huh. dead at the bottom of the pool, or is he coming back up? <laughs> That's hilarious. That is that is a classic documentary that I, I am embarrassed to say how many times I've probably seen. In my <laughs> Me too, man. I know I know that movie too well. The Metal Years. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. And, uh, I I I can relate to a lot of the behavior in that movie, but. Fortunately for me, me, there was no film rolling at the time, or no <laughs> internet, or YouTube, or Facebook, or anything for it to live on in infamy. Yeah, man. And, and you didn't have to take exile in France. So, <laughs> right. right. <laughs> uh, so, all right. So, obviously, you, you know, quasi live the lifestyle, um, but now you're not. So, who was the first one in the band that went? Yeah, this isn't going to work. <laughs> well, you know, we got as far as, you know, we were playing some some high profile gigs and then I think we got as far as getting a development deal with oh, Polydor wow. Records, mm. which I can't remember who was even on the label at the time, probably Ingve Malmsteen or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we just famously imploded like a lot of bands do <laughs> and uh, couldn't hold it together long enough to actually put out anything or, or get to the next level. And... I think at that point in time, I was just so frustrated with, you know, being in a band and the work that went into it. And, you know, as you guys know, it's like being married to four or five other people. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I just got so burned out on it. And around that time, I think uh, I was getting interested in other aspects of the, you know, music related business. So I, I started working at a record store. I uh, went to school for audio recording at a local technical college that had a, a two-year program. So I was getting more into the behind-the-scenes uh, portion of, of you know music and was running live sound for some bands. And, and I kind of discovered that I, I really enjoyed doing that more than I enjoyed playing with people <laughs> at the time. <laughs> well, I, you know... Um, it, you mentioned development deal. Was there was there like money that you guys had to pay back because the it didn't come to fruition? You, you know, if if there was, I didn't see any of it. So oh, okay, <laughs> and that was that was one of the uh, the you know downfalls of the band was uh, we had a we had a singer that uh, wasn't very forthright with a lot of a uh, lot of what was going on. So yeah, man, you gotta love that. Well, you know, it's yes, it's, you know, it's always the singer's band, you know. No matter what, it's always right. the singer's band. <laughs> yeah, um, and you. You'll, well, it's, it's you'll, like Eddie Trunk says, you know, there's music business, and a lot of people forget that second part of the equation, and uh, that's often the downfall of a lot of groups. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, I mean, and, and going into recording, of, uh, you know, that's that's a really cool next step. You know, just to be oh, able yeah. to to continue to be part of it, but in a completely different way. You know, and you can you can make good music. You know, you can you can meet lots of different people and players, and you know, maybe you know get a chance to to play with them. 
uh, and form something different or learn some different music or you know just just watch people playing and or watch more bands implode you know so. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah and I, I i found out that i kind of had a knack for it on, on the technical side and and was was good at you know coaxing the best performance out of people and 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 just communicating with people and working the gear and that and i think that was kind of my introduction that later evolved into what i do now was just you know i i when i was in the technical college in my 20s i remember spending a summer uh with some fellow students wiring up a new atari digital console that we were getting in one of the studios mm. and you know you really haven't lived until you've soldered a bunch of uh mm -hmm. you know wiring harnesses for 12 hours on end oh yeah yeah oh, man yeah. <laughs> Fun times. Fun times. Good times. Good times. <laughs> and then you fire it up and you go, oh, it's not working. <laughs> and then you got to trace everywhere. <laughs> yeah, there's, you know, it's like snakes after snakes after snakes. And, and yep. it's, you know, it's connector after connector after connector. It's such a, you know, glorious life. You know? <laughs> but, but, you know, the, both that running live sound and working in the studio where you're under you know, some pressure and under a deadline, like that really taught me a lot about, you know, working under those conditions and, and, you know, troubleshooting gear, troubleshooting a problem. And if you couldn't figure out what the issue was, figuring out a solution or at least a workaround so that you could continue, you know, the, the process, because especially when you're in a recording studio, like nothing kills the mood more than a piece of gear going down and everyone's just sitting around twiddling their thumbs while I'm scrambling around trying to figure out why it's not working. Right, right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You lose you, that mood real lose quick. Lose momentum, yeah. Right, right. For sure, for sure. So any, uh, did you work with anyone of note in the studio or, or people that eventually became somebody we would know, you know? Not, not that I recall. It was a lot of, uh, I, I was working initially as an intern at a place called emerald studios which i don't think is there any longer and then i kind of worked my way up to being one of the the house engineers and that was a 24 track analog and 32 track digital facility hmm. and this was right around the time when adats were becoming all the rage yeah. and mm -hmm. we actually had the alternative to that which was the tascam d88s right and we had four of those synced together giving us 32 tracks of digital um, we still had the old two inch analog machine, which no one used because even back then, uh, you know, tape was probably $150 a reel, oh, yeah. uh, you know, for 15 minutes, 20 minutes of tape, right? Right. You're you know, running just to 32. get in the studio and record an album. You'd need, you know, $600 worth of tape. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, you're running 32 IPS. That stuff goes real fast. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Like a Dave Grohl segment I was, that played for you that one time. Mm -hmm. He pulls the reel out. He goes, well, this is Monkey Wrench. Right. <laughs> and he's like, and what are the other 50? And he's like, all the other songs, you know? It's right, like, right. <laughs> yeah. How many songs on there? 10. Okay, we're going to need 10 reels. Yeah. You know? At what are they now? Oh, you know, $1,200 a reel, something like that? I don't even know, but I, you know, I think... I think Dave owns them all. You know? <laughs> yeah. He well, just the, buys everything that's made. He's you know? the reason the company's still in Exa employed. Exactly. You know? <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, that, that's, that's, I mean, you know, it's a great environment to be in. Um, did you get a chance to do any recording yourself? Uh, for like my own project? Yeah. Yeah. Or? yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, not so much. I mean, at that time, I think any playing that I did was probably just you know, for my own enjoyment at home, I wasn't really actively trying to play with bands. Um, you know, like I said, I, I really found that niche of, you know, I really enjoyed running live sound for people, uh, recording bands. And uh, so that that was kind of the path that, you know, that I chose back then. Mm -hmm. So what uh, what brought you into the uh the, the gear end of things. I mean, you know, of, of course you were running gear, but what brought you into the guitar gear end of things? How did that come about? You know, surprisingly, not until after I moved to Chicago in 2002. Like, you know, like anyone that played in bands back in the day, I had my fair share of gear and owned and sold various things. But I, I never would have considered myself, you know, a big gearhead back then. And then when I moved out to Chicago in 2002, I bought a chain of uh, record stores 
And that kind of became my focus. And I really didn't touch a guitar for a few years. I was just, you know, I was out here. I was living life. I was focused on my my record store business that I owned. I was, you know, just doing other things. I was married. I had, you know, our dogs. We were in a new city, just getting acclimated to that. Uh, I know, Mick, you're into old cars. I had a 75 Bronco that I still oh. own that. I was fixing up and, you know, I got into motorcycles. So I was doing a lot of restoring motorcycles and cool. Yeah. You know, just, it was still involved technical ability and figuring out stuff, Mm -hmm. but, uh, it was nice to kind of, you know, I was still involved in music because I was owning record stores and, uh, you know, still doing a little bit of recording, but not too much once I moved to Chicago and it was just nice to kind of take a break from it. And then, when I finally did come back to it, um, I kind of approached it with just a new, a new outlook, a new set of uh, eyes, new perspective, and that's where I really dove into the gear part of it because, uh, you know, guitar pedals, you can pick one up for cheap compared to a vintage amp or a vintage guitar, and it does fun stuff, and it's it's a nice. Uh, a, a nice thing to experiment with and uh, coax new sounds out of, and, and it's it's very inspiring to play a new piece of, uh, like a new guitar pedal. Yeah, well, you can pick some of them up for cheap. Most of them for yeah, cheap, well, but yeah. some, <laughs> some not. But it's, it's, it is a lot easier to, to have a plethora of those laying around, you know, just pick them up here and there, have some mm-hmm. fun with them. Oh, there's another cool one, you know, pick up that. Uh, what made you start tinkering with them? I think that goes back to when I was still playing in bands and I had, uh, like a lot of people, the, the Craig Anderton book, Electronic Projects for Musicians. Mm-hmm. And so I was always kind of experimenting with, you know, fixing something if it broke. And I always had a knack for, you know, kind of figuring it out. I, I don't have any formal electronics training, but I, I, I could always kind of fumble my way through it. And then once I, uh, you know, got into the studios and was doing a lot of soldering and wiring things and building cables, it just kind of evolved from there. And then once I got back into, you know, playing guitar here in Chicago and, and getting into effects pedals, I, I just started, uh, you know, mods were a big thing, you know, back in the beginning of, you know, 2000s. And, and I started, you know, ordering kits online to install and just kind of doing it for my own enjoyment just Mm -hmm. as a hobby and quickly found out, you know, just from friends, you know, Hey, can you do one of these for me? And, you know, and then just started kind of growing organically by word of mouth. Isn't that how it starts? Hey man, can you do that for me? It's it's great. You know, (laughs) yeah, I don't know anything about that. (laughs) (laughs) You do that. Can you do that for me? Yeah. Just uh, yeah. Can you, uh, can you make my amp sound better? (laughs) Okay, define better. Define better. And, anyone, and, and it's usually that broad too. Uh, right. It just sound better. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's that's pretty cool. What was the? Do you remember what the first thing was you either built or modified? Like you know, other than repairing it, like oh, it's got a broken jack or a broken pot or something. What was the first thing? Yeah, you really changed? I, I think the first one I tried to modify was just a cheap boss ds1 because they were so ubiquitous uh, and they were mm-hmm. so cheap and you know if you bought one on the used market for 20 bucks and, and messed it up you yeah. were only out 20 bucks, 20 bucks. So i figured the yeah. the uh, risk was pretty low with uh taking a stab at modifying it so what did you wind up doing with it i think i think that one i actually sold at some point because uh I, I kind of quickly found out that i i had a knack for this i mean i i'd been soldering since i was a teenager and I just kind of foolishly assume like, oh, everyone knows how to do that. And, you know, to my surprise, I had a lot of people coming to me that just have this crazy fear of anything electronic and don't even want to pop the cover off of a pedal for fear of uh, the unknown or they think they're going to electrocute themselves or something. Hey, Johnny, can you change my battery? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'll change it. I'm going to put two of them in there. Let's see what that does. (laughs) <laughs> right, right. You know, one of the pedals uh, I always refer to this is because I I owned, I think close to a half a dozen of them. Believe it or not, okay. Mm-hmm. And, and and all the years, rats. And that's the Boss CE two, the course. Oh, the course. The first, ah, uh, the, yeah. You know that that first one, right, right? two knob course. I think was the yes, CE2, and yeah. it was mono. It it did not have right. a stereo right, out, right? right. right. 
I own like six of those. Okay. The last one I paid thirty bucks for. <laughs> Try to find Forest one now so for like under two hundred dollars. Right now, and there's got to be someone that's got to bring it back. <laughs> right. Well, uh, Zach Wald, he uses a chorus all the time because he has it's, his done. It's going to be course. someone in Brooklyn, and they're likely going to have a mustache. <laughs> <laughs> that is. Oh my God, that is true. <laughs> and probably skinny jeans. I love Brooklyn. I have hey, it's, there. Oh, for sure. But, I, I do love Brooklyn. But that's that's going to be the rebirth of the chorus. It's steampunk it's be a chorus renaissance. It's be, it's steampunk chorus renaissance. It's great. We're just going to thicken it up. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> going to thicken up what we already do. Yeah, uh, the rat, the rat, okay. pro, the Proco rat was a big one too. Oh yeah, rat was, yeah, that was yeah. all over the place. Yeah, that thing was like back uh, in my heavy metal days. That was my signature sound, I believe. It was either that or the the uh, the tube screamer. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, which everybody. I also owned. <laughs> yeah, two two very different animals. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> really different animals, and even the um, uh, not so much the early ones. Although the early ones are probably worth. I know they're worth a, a good penny, but it seems that the early ones didn't get popular until the reissue of them came out and somebody famous made the reissue famous, which didn't look like anything like the original, but the um, the, the Big Muffs. Oh. You know, the, you know yeah. I, I, was, I think it was Corgan that made the, yes. the Russian reissue, the first issue of the Russian reissue ones, yes. which didn't look anything like the like the Ram's Head or anything like that. Mm -mm. You know, it, it looked like it was built from spare Russian military parts. Yeah, it did. You yes. know? It even came in like a little crate. I think they crate. actually were. <laughs> I, I think they probably were. I, all that stuff, the, the MIG amplifiers and everything. Yeah, I, yeah, I, remember those? I, I, yeah, and... You know, those those things were a good platform to work on, but the you know the the Russian ones where you could uh, the, the reissue of the the uh, the big muff big muffs that you could you could they weren't that expensive when they first came out, you know, and now they're they're all worth almost as much as the original Ram's Head kind of thing, and it's like yeah, those those Civil War big muffs fetch big bucks on on the uh, used market, that's for sure. The yeah. big muff. Yeah. <laughs> And and you know I've worked on so many of those and you have them apart and you're replacing one part or fixing one thing and five more wires fall off in your hand. Oh yeah, it's <laughs> the thinnest gauge wire I think I've ever seen and and it's like you said it's just you know whatever they had lying around at the time and uh, unfortunately they're they're not known for their uh, longevity that's for sure. That is true. That is oh, wow. true. They um yeah it's it's it's. They're almost as bad as like Gibson amps because not so much from a wire perspective because they're not that good either. But it, you know, you never know what you're going to get. It could say yeah. it could say GA thirty or something or GA fifteen or whatever, and you'd have three schematics for them, and none of them would match the unit that you had on the bench. You know, I think they just <laughs> right. went in Monday morning and go, well, "What do we got? All right, let's start building with this." You know. <laughs> Well, you know, Mike Matthews at Electro Harmonics is a, a legend in the pedal industry, and he's also known as a very frugal guy, and I'm sure it was just whatever he happened to get a deal on, and, mm -hmm. you know, 10,000 of this capacitor at this value, and it's it's close to what's on the schematic, so yeah, we'll we'll take it, and we'll just start using those instead. Sure, and and those are the ones that wind up sounding best and are worth the most money. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> A happy accident. It, that's the way it goes, man. That's the way it goes. So what? Um, yeah, okay, we went from the, the the DS1. What was the first thing that you built? Did you come up with something out of? Did you build something out of Craig's book? Did you buy a kit? And you know what was it? What was the first? I guess quote unquote product that you made something that you built to sell. What well, the the, first thing? the flagship product that I've came up with that you know I can't really take credit for because it's been around forever and it's just a ridiculously simple concept and design was uh, it's called a dead bat and it's a dying 9 volt battery simulator so I saw that. anyone who's played vintage effects knows that you know there was a time when there was no DC power and they just ran off of a 9 volt battery mm -hmm. I remember and that and whether it was a wah or a fuzz pedal uh everyone would kind of notice as the batteries start start to kind of lose its uh, charge that it would affect the sound of the of the pedal and people got really good at determining you know what was kind of the sweet spot of that uh you know the voltage on the the battery and and where it sounded best 
And basically, this is just a you know a voltage regulator that allows you to dial that in and fine tune it. You just place it between in the chain between your power supply and the and a you know modern pedal that has a, a DC power input, mm -hmm. and you can kind of dial that in to emulate a dying battery without having to have a stack of batteries <laughs> at your disposal in various states of freshness. <laughs> <laughs> now here's 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 your um, here's your EJ task as a as a um, a mod for this thing get the output to sound like a carbon battery instead of an alkaline <laughs> right, right. <laughs> because there's someone out there that can tell the difference well ej yes yeah and yes. and there actually is because it has a different it, a source impedance and yeah. they supposedly do sound different he the first time he told me that it was like oh go away stop <laughs> Stop. God it's bless a, him. My ears are too trashed from loud rock and roll to know the difference. Right, right. <laughs> you know, well, like, like I've told this story before. The last time I saw him, he was he was changing, he was changing the length of the wire in his four twelve cabinet before a show. So, wow. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, he's very eccentric. And uh, <laughs> yes, yes. It, yeah. But you know what? He he really does hear stuff. He really yeah. does. It's, and, yeah. it's, it's amazing. You know, it's, it's amazing. And the thing about it is, it's like, it, he's an amazing player. It's just like, yeah. if that's his quirk. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 I'm sure it keeps his techs on, on their toes. <laughs> that that would be a job. Right? Gonna, that would be a job. We're going to trim up those wires by three inches. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I remember seeing him, like, way back in the day, probably when that was Tones, the first album. Yes. Yeah, and I, I remember seeing him at a state fair in Minnesota, and, it, you know, it was a bill with, like, him, and I think, uh, who else was on the bill? It was a, you know, blues player, like uh, Lonnie Brooks or someone like that, and, uh, you know, that was that was pretty early on when I was still a young metalhead in training and, <laughs> and starting to kind of branch off into you know just being a guitar player like oh there's this eric johnson guy that everyone's talking about and he's supposed to be really good and you know and it and it was just blew me away you know just that there were people out there doing that type of music that wasn't metal that was just still so you know technically proficient and just yeah yeah oh, yeah. yeah that's a, you know i was going to say he'd probably like the uh the dead bat but I, I take that back because he probably has a case of carbon batteries that are 8.2 right. volts. So, you know, he's got his own. Yeah, so on. this is just, you know, that was one of the things that, you know, there's, you know, it's basically just a, a voltage regulator. So, you know, simple concept, but I, I managed to, you know, put it in a little enclosure and, mm -hmm. and market it as, you know, something that you could just kind of buy and it doesn't take up a lot of space on a pedal board. And I was also putting that same... Uh, circuit inside pedals where room would allow so you know and if, if i modified a big muff i'd put it in there and it would just it was like an extra feature that you could oh, that's cool. have and yeah you know it was just trying to trying to add options for people that wanted them all right so where do they go from there where do they go from the dead bat you, you went oh, okay this is a product now i have a company so where do they yeah, go yeah you know and it, you know and it this is something that just, like I said, started off as a hobby on my kitchen table, much to the amusement of my wife. And uh, at a at a certain point, I just decided, you know, let's take this to the next level. You know, I was I was still kind of doing the record store, but then I was also getting enough work coming in for you know mods and repairs, and it was just kind of growing organically to where, you know, I was up late at night doing these pedal projects and just trying to keep up with the demand, and you know, at a certain point, I just said, you know, something's got to give. So I, I closed my last uh, retail record store that I had about three years ago hmm. and just dove full time into, into alchemy and, uh, you know, got a space here um, outside of the house, which my wife appreciated. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, it just it just added some legitimacy to what I was doing. You know, now I had a website, I had a Facebook page, I had business cards and it wasn't some guy just like doing this out of his basement. That's cool. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So, um, what what came next? You know, now you got a company. What's uh, what's wh where did the product lines grow to? Was well, it you know, a, a majority of what I do is repairs and mods, and I and I try and keep 
keep it diverse too. So I've got a line of uh, instrument cables, speaker cables that I build, and those are all you know made to order. So you can get your choice of options. You can get colors. You can get you know right angle plugs if you want, straight angle plugs. Hmm. Um, you know I'm doing some amp stuff, but not not my focus. Um, you know I just stay so busy with repairs and mods these days that you know I. I have the breadboard out. I'm, I'm working on some some circuits, but you know we're definitely in a golden age of effects pedals right now. Oh, yeah. And the last thing that someone needs from me is another fuzz pedal, unless it's something interesting and and cool and and offers something that isn't already out there. So in, instead of ground up, you're you're taking existing and and making improvements to them. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, you know, that's definitely my specialty is just taking the ubiquitous, you know, Boss, Ibanez, Electro Harmonics pedals that everyone has on their board or tucked away in their closet and, you know, improving the sound of them, making them quieter, uh, sometimes adding features to them and, uh, you know, just tweaking them a bit to, to really maximize, you know, the potential of, of those pedals. Mm hmm. Uh, and um, have you gotten them to to any major artists that uh, are, are touting your wares at this point? I'm I'm so bad at when an order comes in knowing who someone was, you know, unless it's someone that oh that name sounds kind of familiar, and then I Google them and I'm like oh it's that guy. So <laughs> uh, I'm sure there's probably people I'm forgetting, but uh, you know Doug Pettibone who. Uh, played with lucinda williams for a long time he's actually one of my favorite guitar players ah, yeah. um i've done some stuff for him he's a monster guitar player um chris poland who <laughs> uh you guys know from megadeth i've only killed him um, twice <laughs> yes, <exactly. laughs> <That's right. laughs> we definitely gotta have chris on <laughs> you should he's, he's a great guy and he's really really talented and uh He's been a you know a repeat customer and been you know I, I've worked on some kind of specialty things outside of the normal realm for him where you know he'll contact me and say hey I, I want this you know we were talking about a rat pedal earlier and everyone kind of associates rats with high gain and distortion and metal but there's a lot of people that will actually use them as more of an overdrive and kind of a low gain pedal mm -hmm. which you know especially if you stack it with another dirt pedal of some kind really excel at, at that uh function mm -hmm. I'm, and I'm, so that I'm, was something that we were working on with him where he was like you know can you make this a little bit less uh gainy so i can kind of use it more as just a, a i wouldn't say clean boost but like a boost with you know this with, right amount of dirt on it with some drive behind it yeah 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 no that's cool if, if i'm not mistaken that was uh is, and maybe still is um Bruce's sound. Bruce yeah. Springsteen. Oh, I'm pretty sure really? that a lot of that was Rat. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Huh. yeah. I have to look into that, but I'm pretty sure. That's crazy. Yeah. And a, you know, and a telly. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, of course, he wasn't the only guitar sound on anything, but that's true. That was, um, yeah, that was some of that really nasty, uh, aggressive telly sound you know and he may not may might not have been using that with a ton of gain like you were saying it may just be something with a little more push and growl you know to, to set it at, at lower settings but i'm pretty sure i was using a rat for quite a while and maybe still does i don't know that's that's uh different i didn't yeah. expect that yeah so i i uh i also was watching a uh a video of the uh now you you just build them but they're the byoc um Clone clone, which I thought was yes. a remarkable uh, clone of it. Uh, it is. It's a, it's a pretty faithful recreation of, of that pedal, and um, definitely one of my biggest sellers from that line. And uh, BYOC, for people who don't know, they they specialize in uh, kind of do-it-yourself kits, and uh, what they sell are circuits that are no longer produced so they'll sell you know something a, a univox fuzz clone or uh an old you know vintage big muff you know ram's head clone and and they're pretty faithful recreations of these circuits but they'll have modern conveniences like you know true bypass switching and a, a power jack and leds and uh 
the Silver Pony is their version of a, a clown centaur, and they recently discontinued it because, uh, like I said, they specialize in more obsolete circuits and ones that aren't in production, and you know because the clown is still being produced um, as the KTR. Well, yeah, it's being produced um, again. They decided yeah. not to make it, but you know, it, for me, it was a big seller, and there was definitely a demand for it. And so I approached them about, you know, hey, is there any way that I could continue to, to you know, build these and sell them to people that want them? And and uh, he agreed uh, very generously to offer me the, you know, the circuit boards to uh, continue to to use. And so I'm using the circuit boards they provide, and then I'm just sourcing all the other parts. Which is really nice because it allowed me the opportunity to source some different things, you know, like vintage germanium diodes that weren't in the uh, kit that they were selling, and uh, just add some some upgrades to the you know the final product that that weren't included in the in the kit. Mm -hmm. Do you have a do you have a favorite pedal, or is that one the favorite? You know. I'm a sucker for old fuzz pedals and you know I I've got a Maestro fuzz tone that is it's just one of those magic ones that you plug in and strum a chord and it puts a big smile on your face. The, and, like the real early ones with the single double A yeah, battery. Yeah, the, the FZ1A. Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> and uh there was a gentleman in Florida who had been uh, he's a vintage guitar dealer and he had been sending me these ones that he had accumulated throughout the years that were in various states of, you know, not working or just needed some TLC and I think I ended up working on about five different ones over the course of a few months for him and it was amazing to me how different each one would sound compared to the other and mm. and there were great sounding ones and not so great sounding ones and and I think you run into that a lot with vintage gear whether it's an amp or a guitar or a pedal oh yeah and, and I know amps like all over the years if somebody brought me a really pristine old, like say Fender Deluxe or Princeton or something, or even even before that a, a Tweed, something mm -hmm. like that, if it was really pristine, nine times out of ten, I knew it wasn't one of the better sounding ones because right. it hadn't been used and abused. And yeah, the ones that are really good sounding are are used and abused, rode hard and hung out wet. <laughs> And the ones that just weren't inspiring, they wound up in the closet, you know? And those yeah. are the ones that wow. really look good, but they're not the best sounding ones. That's pretty wild. You know, it's like a good guitar. It's beat to hell, you know? Oh, yeah. The, the other ones are like, yeah, I think I'm going to sell this. You know, it's just, <laughs> right. it's, not, it's just not inspiring. You know, exactly. it's the same way with effects. There's, you know, all the tolerances add up the right way or the wrong way, you know? <laughs> well, and that pedal probably sounded different 35 years ago than it does today. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, there's like I said, there's good and bad sounding ones, and that and that creates a, a challenge when you're shopping online and trying to you know buy some vintage piece of gear, and you know if you if you're not able to plug in and play it first, uh, you're really rolling the dice with some of that stuff. Yeah, well, unless it passes through your hands, and then you know it's, it's <laughs> tweaked and it's right, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, you know the old FZ ones. Uh, of course, they won't sound right without a carbon battery in them. Mm -hmm. you know? Right, right. <laughs> I like that now. Yeah, there you it's go. It's gonna be a new. Uh, it's gonna be a new show tag. It won't sound carbon right unless it's got a carbon everyone. battery. That's right. That's right. <laughs> leave like your leave your carbon footprint. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like our friend Dean with with pure nickel strings. So once they went away, the sound just changed. You know. <laughs> yep. So, oh, that's too funny. Um, uh, what else? Uh, what's your what's your what's your favorite one to modify now? Like, what what do you think? you can do to something that that the customer notices the biggest difference when you're given something do you have do you have something that you go oh man you you got to send me that pedal because the difference is night and day well the the ones that come to mind are some of the boss pedals that everyone seems to own and, and particularly the eq the the seven band eq that everyone has on their really board. wow that thing is one of the noisiest <laughs> pedals in its stock form and, and even to the point where when you bring the faders down rather than up it adds noise to the signal the b and the bf2 is that way also right the original yeah boss. yeah i was I, actually just working one of those earlier this afternoon i owned and one you so would turn on with, you would just with, hear it 
<laughs> so with a couple of those uh, pedals that we that we mentioned, it's just you know swapping out some of the op amps for some different ones that are quieter, uh, swapping out some of the electrolytic capacitors for for different ones that you know are going to be quieter. Um, it, it it's amazing like what just a couple components and and I don't know if it's just attributed to. Uh, a cost thing where you know boss was attempting to keep the cost down and you know the difference between a, a 20 cent capacitor and a 15 cap cent capacitor might not seem like much unless you're manufacturing thousands of them yeah, yeah we won't <laughs> go it, there it, it makes sense why they're using the cheap one but yeah. it, it's really remarkable like how much you can improve the sound of those just by doing a few simple mods that's that's really that's good a, yeah, yeah. I, I, and you know there are uh, there are probably better grade components available now than when a lot of the stuff was made too. You know, absolutely, yeah. Tolerances are a lot tighter. Tolerances yeah. are tighter. There's different materials, I think, that that weren't as easily available, or probably nowhere near as cost effective as they are now to to replace. You know, um, and I don't I don't know how you do. You use like polypropylene caps and anything because I, personally I don't like them in guitar amps. I think they're wonderful in stereos, but you know, and sometimes an improvement like that, it's it's not really an improvement, at least for me, you know, in, in amps. How do you feel about that in pedals? Like the real, really good high-end stuff. Is it really a great improvement in pedals? You know, when, when you're dealing with pedals, with, with some of the component changes, you, you're not going to notice a huge difference. Um, it, it's depends on the pedal obviously but you know what i try to do is look at uh areas where you know in in this day and age too like the the flaws with some of these pedals are pretty widely known so you get a pedal in and it's like hey these are notoriously noisy and these are the areas you should focus on and a lot of times it's just like the the op amp chips or some of the the cheaper capacitors that are easy enough to upgrade. Now, a lot of times I'm just putting like film capacitors in there instead of the electrolytic and, and that seems to quiet things down quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So it just, it really depends on the, on the pedal and the circuit, but uh, uh, you know, some are just more noisy than others. And, and with a lot of them, sometimes there's only so much you can do too. If it's a inexpensive pedal, um, you can, do what you can to kind of maximize it and make those improvements. But uh, I'm, I'm not a miracle worker, that's for sure, with some of the stuff. <laughs> well, I mean, it sounds like you're keeping, your, uh, keeping yourself busy and your hands full with uh, making improvements for all us crazy players out there. Yes. Um, and uh, you, you, um, you actually still retail music through your shop as well don't you you have like uh there's a it's part of it's like a music store or albums or something is it not yeah so uh now that i no longer have an actual retail record store i still do sell stuff online so here at my facility we've got you know kind of an office slash warehouse space where not only is uh alchemy based and i've got my workshop and i've got a little showroom set up with you know all the different demo pedals that i have and and amps and guitars but we've got a, a full warehouse full of you know tens of thousands of cds and records and we still oh, continue wow. to you know sell those online and fulfill orders and vinyl that definitely kind of helps keep the lights on and it's it's a nice way to kind of still be involved in music but keep it you know diversified that's pretty cool that is cool that is pretty cool i mean you know it with the interweb you can sell anything you know yeah <laughs> yeah and, yeah, and, and it's I, and it's something that you know I always tried to do early on when you know when I first started getting into playing guitar was like I loved music so much and just had such an interest in it that I wanted to figure out a way to you know be involved in that and kind of make my my passion my profession and so whether it was uh, you know playing in bands and then later on running sound and working in studios and then the record store I mean it all kind of led up to where I am now and. Uh, I, I think it helped uh, in, in you know different ways to make uh, alchemy as successful as it's been so far. Well, cool. I mean, that is cool. Do you still play? I do. Yeah, and it, you know, and I I have a few friends that will get together and have a few beers and, and 
kick around some guitar licks and stuff. So I haven't ruled out the possibility of, you know, playing in bands again. But uh, I, I just stay so busy with the alchemy stuff. And it, it's fun to just uh, have access to this tremendous selection of, of pedals that, that come <laughs> through the shop. And, and I can kind of, you know, mess around on those as I'm, you know, testing them. And well, you know, hell, if it was me, I'd go, you know, I got, I got two more. We're going to, we're going to take out tonight and we're gonna play, you know, I got to <laughs> right. check these out, you yeah. know, I got, I got to play this before I give it back to the guy. Yeah. You yeah. Know? I got it. So it's got to be a full test. <laughs> Absolutely. May need to keep it a week. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we're going to see how well it takes to a spilled beer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's just more work for me then. <laughs> that is true. That is uh, God. So some of my friends that are, that play in bars that really don't have stages and they're they're elbow to elbow um, <laughs> with with drunk people with with drinks in their hand. Oh, oh my yeah. God, his stuff is getting trashed all the time. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. like I'm I'm constantly amazed at some of the stuff that comes through the shop and the condition of it and also what they can withstand. They can definitely put up with a lot of abuse. I mean, by nature, you're, you're stomping on it with your foot and, uh, yeah, all things considered, they're usually pretty resilient. It's true. Yeah. I, I think he's gotten to the point where the, uh, the top of the pedal board, once it's set up, is covered with a piece of plastic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? Big giant condom. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it's an effects condom. There you go. <laughs> and somebody will, you know what? You need to write that down because somebody's going to do it now. You know, <laughs> next week we'll see uh, effects board condom. Uh, there you go for your uh, stage needs. Thank you. Just send is the that, check. Is that band Gwar still around? They they would probably have a need for that. Oh well, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, 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 Slipknot. They actually Slipknot too. they yeah. actually use condoms on their wireless devices because there's so much shit <laughs> flying around on that stage. That and they, Gwar's the same way. Yeah. They yeah. they call them Jimmies. Jimmies. Yeah. You got to wrap the uh, wireless in a Jimmy. <laughs> not literally a jimmy but you know so well that's that's cool man and um you know best of luck and continued success with yeah. everything and i hope uh i hope everybody that hears this has some kind of pedal they want to send you yeah you have yeah. a look on your face mick oh well i want to get his website but oh, also yeah, yeah. know that the link will be on the show and when it goes to the archives it'll live in perpetuity that's right that's right so you can always get we a like hold of perpetuity. Yes. yes. And you can always get a hold of uh, Johnny through there. Or if you want, you can email us through the show. We can always get you to anybody that we've uh, recorded with, except for if you want to talk to him and ask him questions. That isn't going to happen. It, no, no. Well, uh, you know, unless like, like Johnny, he, he well, would like his phone to ring and yes. you can ask him yes. questions about what you can do for uh, what he can do for your pedals. You know, yeah. And then they will. Bring it on! I'm ready. They will live in perpetuity as well. Yeah, but I won't be giving numbers out for <laughs> some some of our guests because they'd probably come over here and. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they wouldn't like that. It wouldn't be a repeat guest. That's for sure. That's for that's sure. That's for sure. <laughs> well, Johnny, give your website. We'll make sure we put it out there. Yeah, man. As well. Yeah, triple uh, w alchemy hyphen audio dot com. Cool. cool. And I'm also pretty active on social media, Facebook and the Instagram. So yes, you, can, you are. Uh, find me on there. And I, I try and engage people there and post photos of things I'm working on and things that are coming through the shop. Very cool. And can they can they purchase music at the same web address or do you have a different one for that? That would be for secondhandtunes.com. And whether you spell it with the number two or spell it out completely, um, it'll get you to the same place. Ah, so you got both. That's smart. Yes. Yeah. Secondhandtunes.com. I like that. Cool. Yeah. Very. So only only used uh, vinyls and CD? Or is yeah. that just the name you started with and now you have new stuff too? Nope. Just the used stuff now. I'm not currently adding any inventory as far as new products. So. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Well, that vinyl's making a huge comeback, man. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's what they've been saying for 10 years. I'd like to get rid of a lot of what I have. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I I, I, I posted the other day, Barnes & Nobles. I went down there, and there was a whole section of vinyl, and I found Paranoid, Black Sabbath, and oh, yeah? some Judas Priest, some picture disc. I was like, was where it, the hell Was it overpriced? Uh, no. No? No. So, for well, overpriced for when? Because it was like 12 bucks for an album. Okay, no, because I'm I'm thinking some some other places that have just because they have the vinyl, it's it's worth twenty dollars, you know, and, or twenty two dollars. No, no, you know, no. these like, were these were anywhere between twelve to fifteen bucks. That's so totally it was, reasonable. It was totally like nineteen eighty five or whenever. You awesome. Know. Well, and the smart thing they do these days too is they often have a download code with the records. They're giving you the option of you know you can still put it on your computer and then still have the physical oh, vinyl. That's so. cool. 
That is pretty cool. Wow, I didn't that. even know that, man. Yeah. That's that's have, pretty awesome. I haven't gotten into starting to rebuy all the vinyl yet. Yeah. Oh, it's a dangerous rabbit hole to fall into. Oh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> But Sam, someday I'm going to fall back into it for oh, sure. Oh, there you go. Well, Johnny, thank you so much for taking the time. I know you uh, you got to get back to uh, smelling solder fumes. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, you know, <laughs> erase a couple more days off your life. <laughs> <laughs> but think of the happiness he's bringing to his customers. Exactly. So. Exactly. <laughs> well, cool, man. Thank you again. Thanks for taking the time. Much continued success, and uh, people now will know how to get a hold of you and send them uh you know send you their pedals and they'll come back and they'll be even happier than the first time they bought the pedal and it was yeah, new man. so there you go man yeah thank you guys it was a pleasure talking to both of you well likewise yeah, likewise man. and uh you know maybe if we're in the chicago area or if you happen to be in the uh baltimore. in the baltimore area you know maybe our paths will cross and uh we'll say hey and hoist the pint the the first hot dog and beer is on me awesome i will take you up on that too <laughs> yeah, there man. you go All right, Johnny, thank you so much, man. Have a great rest of the evening. You as well. Thank you. Take care. And there you have the story. The the, the alchemic story? Yes. Alchemic story? (laughs) The story of alchemy. There you go. I don't know. I'm making up words. That's good. It's neat. It is. That he does that. Because, you know, there's somebody that's listening right now that's got that pedal that they they didn't throw away. Mm -hmm. And there's something wrong with it. And the guy's looking at it, and he's going, I can't figure it out. Well, now he's got a place he can send it to. Right, right. Get it looked at. Get, get it, it back re- get in Get it repaired. The, get it upgraded. Yeah. You know. yeah. Maybe a mod, if he's got a mod for it, you know? If he doesn't, he'll come up with one. I'm yeah. sure I'm sure he comes up with a new mod every week, you know? <laughs> yeah. It hope, seems hope. like he's busy, so that's good. Yeah. Well, hopefully he gets a chance to see something different now and then and go, you know, I could make this better. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, man. Uh, you know, and if you're ever in that Chicago area, you gotta we gotta check that guy out. Yeah, uh, you know, careful because you can drive right through it. You, know, it's just, you, know, <laughs> you it's miss like, it. It's like Mayberry. It's crazy. You know? Yeah, it's, it's so small. <laughs> it's so small, and they even have a smaller airport. So, yeah. <laughs> oh my God, love that place. Not. <laughs> Oh, Harry. <laughs> oh, Harry. Oh, for Christ's sake. <laughs> that's what they should change it to. Uh-huh. No, that's Midway. Yeah, it's <laughs> or, or Atlanta. Atlanta's another one. Yeah. I oh. remember one time they said, okay, your other flight is over there. And I was like, oh, okay, no problem. I'll just mm-hmm. walk it. And the guy goes, you want to get in the tram? Yeah, yeah. And I said, yeah. what do you mean the tram? And he goes, that's a mile away. At and least. I went, a mile away? I'm like here in the building. How am I a mile away from the other side of it? Wrong building. You got to go down, <laughs> under, and back up. Yeah, I had know? to go under the runway. Uh, d- <laughs> <laughs> Airports, they're big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So until next time, my friend. You betcha. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> we got some next time. I'm Mick Marcelino. That's damn right. You, you are. are. I'm Jeff Bober. And we're always saying. Onward. Be sure and follow the show on Twitter, at Amps and Axis. Also, make sure you like the show on Facebook. For news, comments, and everything else, visit the webpage, ampsandaxiscast.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.